Please be seated. last saw Jonah at the end of Jonah chapter 1, he had been thrown overboard by the sailors in the ship to calm a raging sea. And the chapter comes to an end in verse 17 with these words. Now the Lord provided a huge fish, not a whale, it's a fish, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, this verse typically separates people into two different camps. In one camp are those who have a hard time swallowing this fish story. They say something like, am am I really, really supposed to believe that Jonah was swallowed by a huge fish and survived underwater in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights? This is the kind of story that makes it hard for me to take the Bible and therefore the Christian faith seriously. That's camp number one. Camp number two are those who say, well, of course it happened. It's in the Bible. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. End of discussion. Why are we even talking about this? Now, to those of you in camp number one, and I assume there are several, some, maybe many of you here today. I know there's at least one. It might be helpful for you to hear me say, You do not have to take this story literally in order to take Jesus seriously. There are many Christians, including Christian theologians, Christian scholars, and everyday run-of-the-mill normal Bible-reading Christians who read the story of Jonah much like they read the parables of Jesus. And we do not have to take the story of the prodigal son literally in order to take it Seriously, in order to be encouraged, challenged, and transformed by the point Jesus is making when he tells that story about a father and two sons, which probably never actually happened. And yet a story like that can still be true. It can still contain and convey truth even if it never happened. Now, having said that, would also remind those of you in camp number one that we live in a strange world. And the more we think we know about and understand about our world, the less it seems we really know or understand. And we live in a world where not everything can be proven or explained by science. And if we draw the line and say, I will only believe or accept what makes sense to me or what can be validated by science, we may at some point read about an empty tomb and say to ourselves, you know, I don't think I can swallow that story either. Now, those of you in camp number two, Please don't judge your brothers and sisters in camp number one who read this story as more of a parable. There's nothing wrong with being in camp number two. It's perfectly fine to read the story this way. But there are hints throughout the story of Jonah that 
this story was never meant to be taken literally. Next week, we will see that there are other details besides the fish that are exaggerated, outrageous, absurd, hard to believe. And I also encourage you, don't become obsessed with trying to convince others to take this part of the story literally. Because in your obsession to prove something, to convince others of something, you may end up missing the overall point of the story of Jonah, which has absolutely nothing to do with the fish. Jonah is not about the fish. The fish only is mentioned three times in the entire book, once at the end of chapter 1 and twice in chapter 2. Now, the message of Jonah is about loving your enemies. Well, no wonder we'd rather focus on the fish. The message of Jonah is about loving your enemies and letting God be God, especially when God dares to love an enemy you can't stand. And whether or not we take the bit about Jonah being swallowed by a fish literally is not nearly as important as what happens when we allow ourselves to be swallowed by the story. Which brings me to this question. What would you do if you were trapped in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights? The answer seems obvious, right? You'd hold your nose. But then after that, what would you do? You'd pray. What else could you do? You're trapped in the belly of a fish. And what would you pray when you are stuck in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights? Well, that answer is obvious as well. You would pray, hey, Lord, get me out of here. Maybe if you're Jonah, you would also add a bit of, Lord, I am so sorry. I should not have done, I will never run again. Please forgive me. I repent. Now, Get me out of here. Today, you may be surprised to see that this is not even close to the kind of prayer Jonah prays from the belly of the fish. We have his prayer in Jonah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again. Toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. (laughs) Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But the Lord my God brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Thus said Jonah from the belly, of a great fish. If you'll permit me to oversimplify just a bit, when you read the Psalms, there are three basic kind of prayers you encounter. There are actually a few more, but these are the major kinds of prayers you find in the Psalms. The first are prayers or Psalms of lament or complaint, in which the psalmist is in trouble, crying out for help needing help from above, or maybe just as having a really bad day. 
And these are the kind of prayers you pray when your world is or has just fallen apart. And then there are also in the Psalms prayers of confession in which the psalmist acknowledges sin and asks for God's mercy and forgiveness. These are the kind of prayers you pray when your life has fallen apart because you've sinned and made a mess of things and you need God to restore you. And then finally, there are prayers of thanksgiving in which the psalmist is expressing gratitude for God's care, provision, mercy, and salvation. These are the kind of prayers you pray when everything is right in your world or when your world is coming back together again after it has fallen apart. Which of these kind of prayers does Jonah pray from the belly of the fish? His is a prayer of thanksgiving. Not lament, not confession, but a prayer of gratitude. In fact, almost every line of his prayer is lifted or taken from another psalm of thanksgiving. And you can trace those cross-references in your Bible if you're curious. Now, it appears that this is not the only prayer Jonah prayed during his ordeal. In this prayer, he mentions previously, I called out to you and you heard me in my distress. And did you notice in his prayer, there's imagery of someone sinking to the very bottom of the sea, all the way down to the base or bottom of the mountains, below the sea. He speaks of his plight as being in the belly, not of a fish, but in Sheol, the realm of the dead. Growing up, I always thought that the fish swallowed Jonah as soon as he hit the water, like a trout hitting a fly. But in this prayer, I see that the fish didn't swallow Jonah until well after he had hit rock bottom. And then Jonah prays a prayer of thanksgiving from the belly of the fish. And this is not like in Pinocchio when Geppetto is swallowed by a whale. Jonah is not composing his prayer while sitting at a desk next to a stove in a large cavern inside of a whale. He's in the belly of a fish. He's likely not alone. Other things have been swallowed as well. A fish has to eat. And Jonah clearly is not being digested. And I don't think I'm going out on an interpretive limb here to assume that being trapped in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights is not a pleasant experience. And remember, at the beginning of the story, Jonah has incredible freedom. He thinks he can go anywhere in the world, including to the ends of the earth, all the way to Tarshish to get away from God. And now he can only go where this fish takes him. He has no say in the matter. His freedom has been stripped away from him. He's trapped. It's a kind of exile for Jonah. And yet, he prays a prayer, not of lament, not of confession, but of thanksgiving while he's still in the fish. How is this possible? Well, I have a theory. And this theory is born of my imagination, which the lack of detail in the story invites me to use. It's only a theory. But my theory is the prayer we have in Jonah chapter 2 is the prayer Jonah prayed on the third day. It's not the prayer he prayed on the first two days. It's on day one, he prayed the obvious prayer, get me out of here. 
This is horrible. Please make this stop. Yes, I appreciate you saving me from the bottom of the sea. I appreciate being rescued from the realm of the dead, but this is only a slight improvement. I want out of here. And then at some point, he realizes he's not going anywhere anytime soon. And so on day two, Jonah begins to ask the question, how did I end up in here? How did it come to this? How am I responsible for being in the belly of this fish? How might this be my fault? What can I learn? What is the Lord trying to teach me here in the belly of the fish? What would I do differently if I had it to do over again? What will I do differently if I get to do it over again? You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of the progression of insight found in Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville. You were probably thinking the same thing. Because after the first verse, in the chorus, it's some people claim that there's a woman to blame because there's always someone else to blame. But he says, I know it's nobody's fault. Sometimes things just happen. This isn't anybody's fault. There's no one to blame. But then after the second verse, he says, mm, but I think... It could be my fault. And then after the third verse, he says, oh, but I know, watch your language, it's my own fault. I'm the reason I'm here. I'm the reason I'm in this mess. I'm the reason I'm trapped in the belly of a fish. And now Jonah is ready for day three when he finally can say, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for this fish. Thank you for this time in this fish because it is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Now, maybe that's not what happened for Jonah. It's a theory. Maybe that's not what happened for Jonah, inside of Jonah, inside the belly of the fish, but I do know this. It's what happened to me when I was in the belly of a fish. The year was 1983. I was fishing with my dad off the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. I'm sorry, that's a different story. <laughs> now, seriously, I, I've shared before with you bits and pieces of the story of how my family and I, in 2009, we moved from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Austin, to plant a new church there. And my motives for starting a new church were mixed at best. Yes, I wanted to reach people by starting a new church, but my time at a church in Tulsa had been depressingly, literally depressingly difficult, and I wanted to start over by starting my ideal church from scratch. And my ideal church was a church where I was completely in charge, and always got my way. And after 18 months, for a variety of reasons, we shut that church planting project down. And overnight, I was without a job, without purpose, and without a clue about what I was going to do with the rest of my life. It was the worst season of my life by far, so far. Homer Simpson says, always add the so far because you know it can get worse. But up until this point, it was the worst, darkest season of my life. I really didn't think I was ever going to preach for another church again. I wasn't sure I ever wanted to preach for another church again. And I couldn't imagine another church wanting me, a failed church planner, to be their preacher. I had lost all confidence in myself. I had lost my sense of calling. It felt like I was in exile. Banished from a world and a life I had known so well. 
But after I stopped looking for people to blame, stopped feeling sorry for myself, I began to ask the question, how did I end up here? In what ways have I contributed to this mess that I'm in, that my family's in now with me? And over time, with the help of faithful friends and a no-nonsense counselor, I came to see that many of my wounds were self-inflicted. I went from it must be somebody's fault, it could be my fault, to, oh, wow, <laughs> this is my own fault. And after another 18 months, of asking questions and learning lessons and wrestling with my future and what the Lord was going to do with my life, we finally accepted the invitation to move to Nineveh. I mean, North Dallas. <laughs> to preach for the Preston Road Church. And I enjoyed a fruitful ministry there for 10 years before moving here two years ago, and I love what I'm doing here. But looking back on that season of life in Austin, I can say with absolute certainty that all of that, the failure, the shame, the embarrassment, the frustration, the disillusionment, the anxiety, the uncertainty, all of that was the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm a better man, a better preacher, a better minister, better teammate, better follower of Jesus because of that experience. Far from perfect, still learning and growing, but I am forever changed by the time I spent in the belly of a fish, learning the lessons the Lord needed me to learn. And that's why I think Jonah's prayer from the belly of the fish is not a prayer of complaint, not even a prayer of confession, but the prayer we get to read and ponder is a prayer of thanksgiving. Because after three days and three nights, Jonah has come to understand that the fish, as unpleasant as it may be, the fish and the storm preceding it that led to him sinking to the very rock bottom of the sea were not sent by God to punish him. They were sent by God to save him. To save him from himself. To save him from his rebellious, hard heart. And so, while still in the belly of the fish, he can say, thank you, Lord, for your salvation. And how many times have we heard people say, you know, I wouldn't wish this on anybody else. I really wouldn't. Not even on my worst enemy. I wouldn't wish this, but... This thing that has happened to me, having my lifelong dream shattered, failing in front of so many people, losing my job, getting sick, being diagnosed with cancer, I wouldn't wish it on anybody else, but I got to tell you, on this side of it, I realize now, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. If right now you're fighting to stay alive in a storm, or you're descending to rock bottom, or you're trapped in the belly of a fish in exile, you may not be ready to say it yet, which means you're also not ready to hear someone else say it to you. But someday, you may look back on this painful experience, the storm, the descent, the fish. Someday you may look back and you may say, Thank you, Lord. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. Margaret Wheatley tells the story of hearing a geologist on a radio interview. The geologist specialized in beaches and shorelines. 
And during this interview, the East Coast was being pounded by a hurricane, and the geologist shared his plans to go and study the shoreline and the beaches after the storm passed. And the interviewer asked him, what do you expect to find when you get out there? And Wheatley said she was surprised by the geologist's answer. She expected him to say, well, I expect to find devastation and destruction, erosion. It's going to be terrible. But instead, the geologist calmly said, I expect to find a whole new beach. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes, after the storm, after the descent, after our exile in the belly of a fish, what emerges on shore is a whole new person. And may it be so with us. Jonah chapter 2 concludes with this. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited. Well, this is a severe form of salvation, isn't it? <laughs> and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And then chapter 3 begins this way. And then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Hey, Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. This time, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. And we'll find out next week what happens after that. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, our Lord God, creator of all things, Though it is not always easy to see it and sometimes just as difficult to say it, we thank you for your severe forms of salvation. We thank you for the way you work in our lives, allowing storms to come to get our attention, allowing us to be thrown overboard to hit rock bottom, and allowing us to be swallowed by a fish that holds us in place until we learn what it is you have to teach us. And we ask, Lord, as you are teaching us, you would continue to transform us so that we would emerge from our difficult experiences, from our times of exile, a whole new people. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.